Good, all right. Well, we're there in 2 Chronicles chapter number 29. Uh, an amazing story in the book of 2 Chronicles. We'll start reading in verse number 1 uh, and kind of see where this story takes us. 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old, and he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And look at verse 2, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and Levites, and gathered them together into the east street, and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place." So the context here is this is the beginning of the reign of King Hezekiah, who was a good thing, who did a uh, good king, did a lot of great things, and he is uh, essentially turning the nation around. The king before him was Ahaz, who was an evil king, who was a wicked king, and right now the state of or the country of Judah is essentially in a, a state of disrepair. They're backslidden. Uh, they've been uh, they have not been serving God for quite some time, and he becomes king, and he. Uh, goes against the status quo and does what most kings never did and says, you know what, we're going to turn this around. We're going to get right. We're going to fix. We're going to right our wrongs and do what God wants us to do. What I want you to notice here in this whole chapter is just a story of him essentially carrying this out. But notice he starts with the temple. He is literally about, there's the phrase cleaning house. He's literally about to start cleaning house. He is in a literal sense, going to start carrying the sin and, as he called, the filthiness out of the house of God. The house of God was full of, of idols and it makes you cringe, full of idols and, and, and altars to other gods. And he says, you know, we're going to get this out. We're going to be done with this and we're going to turn this ship around. Now, as a believer, we're not going to look at all the verses, but uh, you should be familiar with the idea that as a believer, the Bible calls your body a temple. The Bible says you are uh, we are priests and kings unto God, and your body is called a temple. So on that note, what I'd like to talk about this evening is I'd like to talk about New Year's resolutions. Of course, uh, hopefully you already have your New Year's resolutions picked out and uh, you're, you're, you're on your way to completing them, hopefully. But I also hope that you have some spiritual New Year's resolutions. I hope that, obviously, it's great to have fitness goals and it's great to have uh, financial goals but I hope that you have some uh, spiritual goals this year. I hope you uh, have goals where you say, you know, I want to get to December 31st of 2023 and said, uh, saying, you know, I, I prayed more this year. I read the Bible more this year. I, um, I, I became a better soul winner this year. I hope you have those goals. And, uh, of course, we've already heard a lot of stats um, so far this year on news resolutions, but just a couple of them, about 40% of Americans, or a little less than half, uh, actually make resolutions. And of those 40%, only about 10% of those actually end up uh, completing their goals. That means that at December 31st, a small minority of people, about 10%, 1 in 10, say, I stuck with my goal the whole year, or I accomplished my goal, or I met my goal. And I, I, would, I would profess that the same things are this, uh, it's the same with spiritual goals, where most people who set spiritual goals probably do not complete them. Now, we don't want that to be us. We want to be able to stick with them. We want to be able to uh, fulfill our goals. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, especially our spiritual goals. So the title of the sermon this evening is Cleaning House. Cleaning House. And what I'd like to do is I'd just like to uh, give us a method tonight on how to prime ourselves for spiritual goals in the new year. And of course, this doesn't just apply to New Year's resolutions. Of course, this is just a time of the year where a lot of people have goals. But this applies to any time in your life. Any time in your life where you realize that you need to set a goal or you want to set a goal for yourself spiritually, uh, that should be done at any time in your life. You don't have to wait for the new year uh, to do that. But I would like to give our, uh, ourselves this evening a method, a, a methodology for how we can complete our goals, stick with our goals, and get to the end of the year having fulfilled our goals. You're there in Hebrews chapter 12. Just uh, before we start, let's, let's talk about why people don't meet their goals, why people fail at their goals. There, there was a study done among people, among the 90% that failed, where these people were asked, why did you, why, why was it that you did not uh, complete your goal? Why did you fail at your goal? And of course, there's a lot of different reasons that people gave. 
But about half of the people that did not meet their goals said that it was uh, either they forgot their goal or they didn't keep track of their goal. If you're there in Hebrews chapter 12, let's look at verse 1. The Bible says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I believe that, not, you know, while there's a lot of different reasons people don't meet their goals, I believe all these, these, these different uh, these reasons are essentially weights. People want to set a goal, they want to run a race, but they have all these weights that they're dragging along with them that keep them from finishing their goal. These weights can be anything from uh, laziness to complacency, lack of motivation, uh, lack of determination, but whatever they are, they are weights that prevent people that will eventually stop them from meeting their goal. So this evening, how can we clean house? How can we cut off these weights? How can we get rid of them? And meet our spiritual goals and crush them in 2023. I'd like to give you three things this evening. The first one is this. Uh, turn back to 2 Chronicles 29. Keep your place there, by the way. We're going to be coming back to it throughout the whole sermon. So maybe use a ribbon or bookmark or stick your bulletin in 2 Chronicles 29. The first thing we see this evening is this, the conviction. We're, we see this story here where Hezekiah becomes king, and he doesn't just say, man, it'd be nice if we could turn back to God, or it'd be nice if we could kind of become more spiritual. Things are kind of rough right now. We're not very spiritual. We should probably get around to changing that every, uh, at some point. No, Hezekiah becomes king, and he's determined. And the first reason that he did this is we see in Hezekiah that he had some serious conviction about his goals. What is conviction? Conviction is defined as a strong persuasion or belief. If you want to have your goal and you want to meet your goal, you need to start off, just before you do anything else, you need to start off with a strong conviction on what your goal is and why you want to meet it. Let's look at verse 6. Our story goes on here. Hezekiah is explaining why. He's, he's explaining why he is so adamant about cleaning out the house of the Lord. He says in verse 6, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore, so he's saying, he's admitting his, the fault of his nation. He's saying, we haven't been doing this. We have not been serving God like we were supposed to. And wherefore, because of this, he says, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem. And he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his, his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Hezekiah was, had a very strong persuasion and belief about why he was doing this. He believed very strongly. He says, look, our, our nation is in a state of disrepair. Uh, we, we've been invaded by other nations. We're, we're falling to pieces, and it's because of our mistake. It's because we have not served God. So because of that, here is my goal. Because of that, we're going to make a covenant with the Lord our God, and we're going to turn this around. He believed very strongly in what he was doing, and more importantly, why he was doing it. Turn to Acts chapter 2. While you're turning there, I'll read you another example of some strong, someone with some strong conviction. Uh, Psalm 44, 17 and 18 says this, All this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from the way. So here, the author of this psalm is describing a very difficult time they're in. He's saying, you know, but nevertheless, that doesn't matter. That does not change our conviction. We'll never stop serving God. We'll never back down. Our steps will not decline from the way. That is someone who, is, who has more than just a temporary excitement about a goal. That is someone with a deeper conviction on why they are doing what they're doing. If they're in Acts chapter 2, let's look at verse 37. This is af after um, Peter preaches this great sermon and he, uh, about Jesus Christ. And, and it says, verse 37, Now when they heard this, this is the people at the day of Pentecost who heard this, this sermon, it says they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, 
what shall we do? Let's skip down to verse 41. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So he, all these people, are they're pricked in the heart and they get saved. But notice what it says about these people. It says they gladly received his word. You see, someone who receives the word of God, and this is how, in this situation we're talking about salvation and the gospel, but it applies to everything. Someone who receives the word of God is someone who fears God. This is, why the, this is why someone needs to believe before they can get saved. They need to believe in hell. They need to understand that they deserve it because no one is going to receive the word of God if they don't fear God. They don't realize they don't, uh, that there's punishment. If they don't realize there's judgment, they'll never receive his word. And on top of that, so someone who receives the word of God fears God, but someone who fears God, and this is the same thing for a saved believer, will have strong convictions. Because a saved believer who is wise realizes that Yes, you'll never see the flames of hell that he that overcometh will not be heard of the second death. However, there is still the fear of God that you need to have because there will be punishment from God in this life if you don't follow him. So in the same way as if you're saved, you had to receive the word of God and fear God to, to get saved. In the same way, you need to take that fear of God and let it have a, give you a conviction, a strong persuasion of belief that, that uh, inspires you to serve him in this life. Turn to Mark 4. Turn to Mark 4. I'll read you one more verse while you're turning there. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this our God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Again, just another very strong conviction that we see there. Here in Mark, this is Jesus talking uh, about the, this is the parable of the sower. He talks about the different types of people, and this is him describing the parable to his disciples. Uh, notice this type of person we're reading about here. Uh, Mark 14, 16 says this, And these are they, which uh, likewise, which are sown, sown on the stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. So this is someone who gets saved. They receive the word of God, they receive it with gladness. Same language we saw in Acts chapter 2 about those people that got saved. But notice what he says, verse 17, these people, they're saved, however, and have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. And afterwards, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So this is the person who gets saved. They will always be saved. Nothing can change that. But they get saved, and they like the Bible thing. They like the whole soul winning and hard Bible preaching thing. They, they like the, the promise that the Bible will change your life, which is true. They like the promise that, hey, if you keep the Bible and you change your life, it will, it will improve your life and it will fix the, every problem you have in your life. The Bible, the Bible ha, it has the answer and the Bible has the solution. These are the people who get saved and they, they like that and that sounds good to them. And they, they like the soul winning and they, they, like, uh, they like the ideas that they're hearing, but when it gets hard, they quit. And you say, but why? Why did they do that? Here's why. Here, here's how we can avoid this to ha from happening to us. Because this, this is a saved person who this happened to. Here's how we can avoid it from happening to us. We need something deeper in our, our Christian life, our motivation for serving God and keeping our goals. We need something deeper than that sounds pretty good. We need something deeper than that makes sense. We, we need something stronger than that. We need a strong conviction about why we're doing what we're doing. Turn to 2 Timothy 4. Because look, you, yes, I mean, it, it's good. You, of course, you need to have confidence in what, in what we're doing. And, you, you know, you do need to uh, uh, believe in, in the, you know, the promise that the Bible will change your life. And, but you, it, it takes more than that. You need to know what you want to accomplish spiritually, how you're going to accomplish it. You need a plan. But you need to know why you want to accomplish it. You need to have the end in mind and have the confidence that, you know what, no matter what happens, kind of like we talked about this morning, although it may not be clear that at the moment, I know that if I do this, at the end, th there is a light at the end of the tunnel. At the end, it will work, and you, you need to have that faith. Actually, if you have your hymnals, I'll just read you a verse that kind of illustrates this. Turn your hymnals to Psalm 134. If your hymnals there, uh, turn to, to song number 134. Here's a good example of this if you look at that song. Look at the third verse. Song 134, My Anchor Holds. The third verse says this, 
I can feel the anchor fast as I meet each sudden blast. And the cable, though unseen, bears the heavy strain between. Through the storm I safely ride till the turning of the tide. So this verse is talking about the fact that obviously our anchor is Jesus Christ. Our anchor is the Bible. And if you set your goals, if you say, you know, I'm going to set this goal for my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my life and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this in my life. I'm going to change this about my life. I'm going to separate. I'm going to start going soul winning. I'm going to start reading the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible this year. Whatever your goals are, if you have a spiritual goal, that goal is an anchor because that goal, if it lines up with the Word of God, then that goal is an anchor. That will, that will, that is, that goal is, is what, if it's what God wants you to do, that goal is an anchor that will change your life. But here's the thing. There are times in life where you're sailing along the ocean in your ship, going through life, and you can see the waters are crystal clear, and you can see your rope, you can see the chain that, that ties your ship to the anchor, and you can see every single link that goes all the way to the anchor. And it makes total sense to you. You can see from where you are now all the way to the, to the end result of that goal. It makes total sense to you, but there are times in life where maybe the waters get murky. Maybe, maybe things get uh, uh, troublesome, and you can't see. You can't see how it's going to work out. But you need to have that confidence that, you know what, as long as this goal is grounded in the Bible, it's anchored somewhere down there. You need to have that confidence. Because here's what people do. People can see the chain that goes all the way down to the anchor, and it makes total sense, and they can see it all the way down. As long as they can see that anchor way down there, they, they're fine. But if things get tough, and things get confusing, and you know the uh, trib- trials and tribulations come, like it talked about here in this parable, and people can't see the anchor anymore, and all they can see is the chain just disappearing into the water, you know what people do? They, cu- they cut it off, and they sail off in their own direction in life. Very similar to what we talked about this morning. You need to realize there's a long game here. It's more than just the the immediate uh, result of your actions. You need to realize that, you know, sometimes it requires faith in the Christian life. Sometimes it takes, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to have a conviction that is strong enough in my life that if I follow the Bible and I I, I push towards this goal, I may not be able to see how it's going to work out every single day as I go through life. But I know that somewhere down there, this, this, this goal, is, is this truth that I'm following, is anchored somewhere down there, and you need to have that faith. We can't just cut the anchor loose every time we can't see it anymore because we think it's not there. So, you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because look, you should, be, you should be excited about the cause that you want to devote your life to. Don't get me wrong. But you need something stronger than that. You need to be convinced of it. No matter what happens, you need to be convinced of it. Turn to 2 Timothy 4, or you should be there. Look at verse 16. This is Paul kind of towards the end of his life. What this, many people believe this is the last epistle he ever wrote. And here he's writing to a man named Timothy, and he's kind of summing up his life here in a way. And he's kind of describing what his life was like. He says in verse 16, At first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. And then he just he has a very, very great phrase here. He says, I pray that it may not be laid to their charge. That's just a great phrase here. Paul, all these people did Paul wrong his whole life. And just as Jesus Christ on the cross said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here Paul says, you know what? I pray God doesn't even judge them for it. I pray it's just not laid to their charge. But anyway, verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Look, no one could accuse Paul of doing the things that he did just for the fun of it. There was very little fun in it for Paul. His whole life was, he, I, I don't know if there was ever a time when Paul could see the chain going down to the anchor through the water. His whole life, it was not fun that got Paul through the Christian life, it was a deep, strong conviction of what he believed. Notice he says this, he, he's just, he's, you can see the courage in his voice. Here he's under house arrest at this time in Rome, and uh, you know, many people believe that he was awaiting his execution. Uh, you know, he, he, was, he was about to be executed soon. We don't know that, but that's what many people believe. And here he's saying, you know what, God's going to deliver me. No matter, whether I die or in life or in death, God has delivered me. He will do, deliver me. Worst that happens is I go to heaven. But notice what he says. He, he, see, Paul knew the end result. He said, here's why, though. Here's why I'm doing this. 
He said, I have done this that the preaching might be fully known. He knew why he was doing what he was doing. He knew the goal. He knew what he was accomplishing. And that gave him a conviction that could not be shaken. He had, because look, not only should you have a mission in your life and a goal and, and, and a purpose. You, you need all those things. But those things need to be fueled by unshakable confidence in what you, what you are devoting your life to. Or, or you won't make it. It's not enough. Another good example of this is 1 Corinthians 9.23. I'll just read it. This is Paul uh, also uh, writing. He says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul said, You know what? I, I, it's hard. It's difficult. People are stabbing me in the back. I'm going through all these. People are trying to kill me. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. But I'm doing it for the gospel's sake, so it's all okay. And so I'm going to keep going to the very end. So, if you want to clean house in your life and use your temple for accomplishing great goals, you need a conviction. You need a strong one. You need one that's rooted in something deeper than just, well, it's fun and I'm enjoying it. And like I said, you should, you should have fun. If you just never have fun in the Christian life and you never enjoy it, there's something wrong deep down inside of you. However, it's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be, uh, sometimes it just requires uh, courage. You know, sometimes it just requires duty and where you just, you know what, I do it because it's right, because I believe in this. And I know that at the end of the day, somewhere down there in that water, there's an anchor that is anchoring what I'm doing to the Word of God. But not only do we need the conviction, but we need the action. Uh, go back to 2 Chronicles 29. We need the action. Let's continue our story. Hezekiah goes on to say this. So Hezekiah gets up and he gives his conviction and he lays the groundwork and says, here's why we're doing what we're doing and I believe very strongly in this and here's why. But he doesn't just leave it at that. He has a plan. He has action that he's going to carry out. Verse 11, My sons, be not now vigilant, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. And then this is phrase, Then the Levites arose. Arose. Skip down to verse 15. It just, it, we just kind of go over some names. And they gathered the brethren. Just know, as we're reading these couple verses, notice that this isn't just people speaking. This is action that's being carried out. This is a plan that's being executed. And they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came, according to the commandment of the king, by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord in the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out abroad into the brook Kedron. Now they began on the first day of the first month. So that's kind of interesting how they said this was their New Year's resolution, right? They started this on their January 1st. First day of the first month is when they, they began this. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the 16th day of the first month, they made an end. So they start on the first day of the year. And it takes a little over two weeks, the whole process. But what I want to focus on is how they took action right away. I, I think that if there's any one word in the Bible that you could pick that symbolized action and, and, and executing a plan, I think if there's any one word that, that kind of shows this in the Word of God, I think it's the word arise. You see it a lot in the Bible. And any time the Bible, God is telling someone, do this, do that, you need to take action. You need to go do this and go, or go do that. The word that is used is the word arise. I'm just going to read you a couple examples. You don't have to turn there. Deuteronomy 10:11 says, And the Lord said unto me, Arise and take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land. Genesis 13:17, Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Judges 7, 9, And it came to pass the same night, that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thy hand. We go on for, for, for hours reading all these verses. But when God tells someone to do something, he tells them, not, he doesn't just give them a plan, he doesn't just say, here's how it'll work out for you. He tells them, get to work. Arise, get up, get off from out your chair, and go and do this specific thing. Turn to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. We're going to read about Elijah. This is a context here is Elijah has just had the legendary showdown at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal where they set up two altars 
and they say, you know, we're going to find out who's God, if the Lord is God or if Baal is God. And, and the, the priests of Baal spend all day, and they, it, it's a whole story, and they can't get fire to come down from heaven. And Elijah goes, and he gets fire to come down from heaven, and it, and it you know, uh, it show, everyone's, everyone fears the Lord. And it's a great story. And then he goes, and he kills all the prophets of Baal. And because of this, Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, wants to kill Elijah. And so he flees for his life, and in this story, you know, Elijah's life, he's at one chapter, he's at the peak of his life, and this is how it often goes, and then the next chapter, he's way down here. He's at the worst, lowest point in his life, and here Elijah is at the low, he's at the bottom of the barrel of his life, just after this great victory, where he's asking God, he's like, Lord, just take my life away, it's not even worth, he's at a very low point in his life. And in verse 5, 1 Kings 19, 5, it says, the Bible reads, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Here God sends an angel to Elijah. And what does he tell Elijah? What's the message God has for Elijah? Arise, get up. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake bacon on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and lay him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. So here, the message for Elijah is, you know, Elijah, I know it's too hard for you. I know you can't do it on your own strength. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to arise. I want you to get up. I have somewhere for you to go. I have a job for you. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights into Horeb, the mount of God. You see, God is always trying to get us to take action, not just sit there and do nothing. Turn to Joshua chapter 7. And this is why a lot of people fail at goals. They make, a, they make a goal, which is great. You need a goal. And they make a plan, which is great. You need a plan. But they never take the action. They never put the work in. Because it's a lot easier to make a plan. It's a lot easier to make a goal than it is to actually take the action and put in the work. All these, all these things are necessary. But it's a lot harder to put the action in than it is just to come up with the goal. They're in Joshua 7. This is when they're, they're overtaking the promised land. Moses has died and Joshua is leading them into the promised land. And there's uh, someone has, they, they went and when they overtook Jericho, uh, there was a man who, who sinned. There's a man, who, uh, who, a man named Achan who went and God told them, I don't want you to keep any of the, 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 the treasure you find. And someone didn't, didn't follow this. They took a bunch of the gold they found and they buried it into their tent. And because of it, God put a curse on the whole congregation to where when they went into the next city to overtake it, they, they failed. God wouldn't fight for them. They, the people died. And Joshua is kind of horrified by this. And so he goes and he's on his face praying to God. And he doesn't know why it happened. He doesn't know what's going on. And here Joshua is praying. And God says to Joshua, notice what he says. Joshua's praying. He's praying to God. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus on thy face? He's like, what are you doing? Get off the ground. There's work to do. There's action that needs to be taken. Verse 11, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed against the covenant with which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. And so God just explains to him, look, someone sinned. Someone didn't listen to what I told them to do. And because of it, there's this curse upon you right now. There's a curse upon everybody. Verse 13, again, up, sanctify the people. And he tells them the details of what he wants them to do. But point being, it's not just enough to have a goal. It, look, goals are great. Plans are great. Prayer is great. You need prayer. You need all these things. You cannot go without them. Consideration is great. Conviction is necessary. But if there is no action, it's all for nothing. And God realizes this. He goes up, he sees Joshua here, and, and it's good for Joshua to pray, but God realizes it, that he needs, Joshua needs to take action. Him laying on his face and praying in this moment is not going to solve the problem. I want you to get up, Joshua, and you need to fix the problem. You need to take specific action and put some work in to fixing this problem. Even so with us. We need prayer and we need conviction, but if we're not willing to take the action, it's worthless. It's completely worthless. And even if you're praying, you're saying, well, but I'm praying and I don't know what to do in my life. And I'm praying for direction. I don't know. Well, there's still action you can take. 
You can still take the action of serving God, reading your Bible, the things you do know, taking what you do know in your life and showing God, you know, God, I, I don't know what to do in this point my, in this area of my life, but you know what? I'm willing to put the action in where I can. That makes a world of a difference. You don't have to turn there, but Mark 16, 19 says this. So this is when Jesus ascends into heaven. So then after that the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right side of God. And they went forth, the disciples, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So here the disciples go out, and it says they go out and they put in the work. They're preaching everywhere. They're putting in the labor. We see that in the book of Acts. And God, it, said, it didn't say God worked for them. God worked with them. The same thing is in the Old Testament. When they would go in and God would win a battle for them, he wouldn't just say, all right, guys, watch this. You just sit here, you stay in your tents, you just, you just go, uh, go about life. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to defeat the Philistines. I'm going to go over here and destroy Jericho. God actually says, no, you know what? I want you, to, I'm gonna, you can do it with only 300 people, but I want you to go get, gather people. I want you to go find pitchers. I want you to go get swords. I want you to find trumpets. I want you to go to battle. I want you to fight, and then I'll work with you, and then I'll honor that. That's how God works. We need the action just as much as we need the conviction. God will, God will support you. He will fight for you. He will help you, but we need to be willing to put in the action. And this happens, uh, you know, this is a mess of a, a lot of churches too, or, or Christians, it goes both ways, but a lot of, uh, a lot of churches today you'll see, will, uh, they'll, they'll say, you know, we need to pray for revival. We need to pray that, that God will just, and they have this idea that, you know, we're just going to kind of stumble through the Christian life and meander along our way and pray that God will just one day come down and cause this miracle to happen in America where everybody is falling down at our feet saying, what must I do to be saved? And, and look, that, that would be great. But here's the thing, that will never happen. I'm not saying that there couldn't be a revival in America. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that the Lord's his hand is shortened that it cannot save. But if it is to happen, it's going to happen because we need to put the work in first. We need to show God, you know, Lord, we're, it's hard right now. There's a lot of sin in our nation right now, but we're willing to go out. We're willing to spend the hours and go door to door to door to getting as many people saved as we can. We're going to stand up and preach the word of God and not be ashamed of it. We're going to put the work in, and Lord willing, God will honor that and then work upon that. That's what our mindset needs to be. So, not only do we have the, we have the conviction, we need conviction in our life. We need the action, that's just as important. But then this evening, what will happen if we have these two things is we're going to have the exploits. Our story continues. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. So here in this story, of course, um, in, in the rest of the chapter, we won't read the rest of chapter 29, but they have this great event where there's offerings. I mean, it's, just, it's the biggest great event that they've had in a long time. There's, they're offering all these animals to God. They're worshiping God. They're singing praises to God. And they're actually offering so many animals that it mentions that the priests aren't even, there's not even enough priests to do it. They have to have other people help them just because there's so much, there's so many animals that people are offering to the Lord. And then it gets even better. God honors this. They put in the initial work and God honors that and says, you know what, this is just the beginning. I'm going to allow you to do a lot more. Because here's the thing, the more you clean house, we'll talk about this later, but the more you clean house, the more, the more, the more great things God will allow you to do in your life. You're there, 2 Chronicles 30, look at verse 1. It gets even better. This is just the beginning. And Hezekiah sent to all Judah, Israel and Judah. So he's sending people to both Judah, which is his nation, but then he's also sending people to Israel, which is much worse than they are. And wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Why? To keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Hezekiah says, man, this was great. This was event was great. Now let's have a Passover. Now, now let's do even more. Let's have an even greater event. So now they're going to hold, for the first time in a very long time, they're going to hold a proper Passover. Look down at verse 13. Said Chronicles 30, 13. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. 
And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. And all the altars for incense took they away and cast them into the brook Kedron. So in preparation for this, they clean house. They go in the temple, they get all the, the garbage out, all the altars out, and they throw it out. And then they go even further. They have this Passover, all these people gather, and then they go through the whole city. And they do the same thing. They clean all the houses. They clean every house. And they go even further. Skip down to verse 26. Notice this. So, because of this, so there was great joy in Jerusalem. See, there is joy. There is joy. But you've got to push through the difficulty to get to the joy. For since the time, look at this. This is a statement. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. So it literally says that they, they did such great things at this Passover that the joy in the, that, that they had in the time that, that this event was, that they hadn't had an event like this since back during the golden age of Israel when Solomon was king. That was how amazing this event was. Then the priests, the Levites, arose, there it is again, and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, talking about God, even to heaven. So notice how significant this was. And here's the point. If you commit to cleaning house, yes, you're going to need conviction, and yes, it will require action and the hard work, but at the end, there will be great exploits as well. The work will pay off. Turn to John 15. But here's the thing, though. Everybody wants the exploits. Everyone wants the anchor at the bottom. But no one wants to clean the house first. Because, you see, that's necessary. You cannot, this is a blanket statement, but you cannot have the great exploits in your life if you do not clean house first. We need to first, before we can do, reach those great exploits, and before we can, uh, before God will allow us to do great things for Him in our life, we need to first go through our heart, and we need to take all the garbage, and the trash, and the sin, and the bad habits, and the laziness, and the fear, and the complacency. We need to wipe down every service, and, and take all the trash, and bundle it, up, bundle it up, and throw it out, before God says, you know what, that looks like a, a, a temple clean enough for me to work in. I was just talking to someone earlier about how I thought it was interesting. Um, I was talking to someone earlier this week and how the two times that God will dwell with people, the two times in the Bible that God dwelt personally, uh, God the Father is personally dwelling with man, is in heaven when everything is perfect, and in the Garden of Eden before sin, before man fell. He mentions with Adam and Eve that God was, at the time when he discovered them, says he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Because man was perfect, God was able to, to walk with them and be with them in the same physical location with them. And this is when God the Father, not just, not just Jesus Christ, when he was, you know, he, as he appeared a couple times and as he was here on this earth and other places. But it's the same way in this sense, where if we want God to do something great in our temple of our body, if we want God to use us, we need to clean house first. And like I said, the better we clean, the greater works that God will do with us. Because I don't care who you are this evening, and I don't care what you think your strengths are, or what you think your weaknesses are, I, I don't care what you think your shortcomings are, or where you don't think uh, you're as great in certain areas, I can promise you that if you can clean house in your life, God can use you mightily, no matter what your shortcomings are. God can use you mightily. God, it, God uses the weak, and God uses the incapable way more than he uses the strong and powerful in the Bible. God uses the 300 before he uses the millions. But you need to clean house first. You need to take the faith first and have the conviction and the action, and then God will honor that. Here Jesus in John 15 is explaining this principle. He says, verse 1, he's, he's setting up an analogy here, so notice what he's saying. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So he's saying, you are clean, and in the sense that you're saved, you're washed with the blood of Jesus Christ. But look what he says, verse 4, he says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch 
cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. So here's the analogy. If you have a tree, if you have a tree, you'll see it growing, and the trunk will grow, but the branches will grow with it as well. The branches will bear fruit, but if you go and you just cut a branch off a tree and you throw it in the ground, it's like nothing's going to happen. It needs to be attached to the tree. It has to be attached to the vine, to the trunk of the tree. And in the same way, what Jesus is saying to them, he's saying, you know, you're, you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You're saved. You believe. But if you want to bear fruit, if you want to, you, you, need to, you need to be, we need to be on the same team here. That's what he's saying. You need to abide in me because you can't bear fruit unless that branch is purged and, and fit, for, fit for the master's use. You have to be purged first. Turn to Acts 19. In Acts 19, I think this is the greatest example in the Bible that we see of this, or in the New Testament at least. I, I think this is a perfect example of this. Here they go into a city. Paul and his team of missionaries goes into a city and they get all these people saved. And notice verse 18, Acts 19, 18. And many that believed, many, not, not all, right? Because, you know, all it takes to believe is to be, uh, to be saved is to believe, but not all those people are, are going to turn their lives around. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which had used curious arts. These are people who, you know, they were using sorcery and, and they were just in all this sin and wickedness. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So all these people get saved and all these people come together. And they, they come to one place and they take 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of their books, which represent just the sin in their life and their old ways, and they burn them. And they got rid of them. They, they literally scorch and burn the sin out of their lives. But look what happens next. Verse 20. This is not an accident. There's a reason that verse 20 is here. So, because of this, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Look, the hand of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. But the reason that the great things do not happen in our lives if they don't is not because God is incapable. It's not because he can't. It's, if the word of God does not mightily grow and prevail, it's not his fault. It's because we are not willing to clean house enough for him to use us. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Like I said, you, no matter another blanket statement that is 100% true, no matter who you are, God can use you to do great exploits. But you have to clean the garbage out first. You have to clean your temple out first. And the, and the more you can clean and the more you can get out, the greater God, the greater things God can do for you. Let's turn to one more verse. 2 Chronicles 31, verse 1. This is probably the climax of this story. You say, that Passover thing was pretty cool, but that's probably as good as it got. It gets better. It gets better. 2 Chronicles 31, verse 1. Second Chronicles 31, verse 1. Now when all this was finished, it's all over. The Passover is done. Everyone had a great time. All these amazing things happened. Now when all this was finished, all Israel... So, Judah is the better nation at this time. God judged Israel way before he got to Judah. Israel is more wicked. Israel is more evil. But look at what it says about Israel. This whole verse is just about Israel, who, the people who came from Israel to Jerusalem. Now, when all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah, so these people are on the way home, and they're going through the cities of Judah on the way home, and notice what they did, and break and images the pieces and cut down the groves, and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin, and Ephraim also and Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession, into their own city. So these people go home, and they're so filled with zeal, they're so fil filled with, 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 this, with, with courage and with the Spirit of God, that they go, it started in the temple, and then it went to the city of Jerusalem. And then Israel, on their way home, they go through all the cities in, in, in Judah and into their own country, and they, just, they, they clean house there as well. 
The, so the house of God is cleaned. Jerusalem, they clean house. And through the whole nation, they utterly destroy all. They get rid of everything. They, they clean all the sin out and destroy it all. You see, here's the best part of this. Not only, if you can manage to, to, to start a fire in your, in your soul and, 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 and do these great works, and if you can, if you can just have this strong conviction, and you can take the action, you can put in the work, and you can start this fire in your life, the best part about it is it doesn't, doesn't just have to end with you. Because if you can have the conviction, just like Hezekiah, this is one man that started this. This is one man that had the conviction, and put in the action, but the best part is if you, like Hezekiah, can do this, you can set a fire in other people's lives to where they will do even greater works than you. Where they will do, they, they will, it's like, imagine someone who they just have a filthy house. Their, their house is filthy. A, they never clean it. It's just full of trash. It's heaped, heaped over with garbage. And then they come to your house and your house is spotless. You know what they're going to think? They're going to say, I want a house like this. I want a house that's this clean. And if you can go to other people, in, in other brothers and sisters in Christ, people, people that are also saved like you, and you can set this fire in your life, and they can see you, and they can see this is where the lifestyle evangelism comes in. If, if you can, we need to preach the gospel to get people saved. But when, once people are saved, if they can see the zeal in your life, and they can see what you've done, you can inspire them to do great works in their life as well. Just like Hezekiah, just like Hezekiah was able to, he, he was one person, but because of his conviction and his action, he was able to inspire a whole nation and part of another to do great exploits for the Lord. So this evening, in conclusion, we need to have the conviction. We need to believe in what we're doing. We need to believe that even if we can't see the cable, even if the waters are muddied, even if times are difficult or hard, we know there's an anchor down there and we're willing to put in the work to do what God has called us to do. And if we can do that, if we can manage to do this, then so can we, no matter who we are, so can we be used of God to accomplish great spiritual goals in 2023. We can get to the end of the year and say, you know, I got through the whole year, and you know, I'm a bitter soul winner now. And I've read the Bible this year, however many times and, and I learned to pray this year and I grew, I grew closer to God this year and he allowed me to do all these exploits and I, he allowed this to happen and this to happen and all these problems were fixed in my life we can have that in our life we can accomplish these goals if we can clean house just like Hezekiah did and we can accomplish these goals in 2023 and even better than that whenever we so choose alright let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer